I've, I've titled this Revelation in Real Time. And the reason I chose to title it this way because of the way I've been advertising that, uh, you know, I'm not, really, I'm not really interested in doing just another revelation type study. I mean, there's, there's so many of those. There's, I'm sure there are many, many wonderful, wonderful studies. Many of you probably have been in some revelation studies that were just fantastic. Um, you know, I, I, there's thousands of them out there. And, uh, and I'm not interested in just doing just another thing that's already been done before. But rather, you know, I, I, because there are so many out there, and please just, just let me, let me just, this, tonight's an introduction, but because there are so many out there, if you got online, if you got on YouTube or you, you know, you, you Googled or something, you'll find thousands and thousands and thousands of studies. A lot of people, that's all they like to study is the book of the Revelation, and prophecy and things like that. And, 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 and there are some that that's just, you know, that's really all they know. And, and the, the problem is so much of that that's out there, frankly, has a lot of errors in it. You know, despite all the good ones, there's a lot that have errors. And I'll tell you, I, I believe that, that those that are, that have serious flaws in them uh, come about because of two reasons. The first is that there are too many, too many Christians who, who want to, you know, we, we have a tendency to make claims that we know stuff that we don't necessarily know, okay? You know, and especially in something like the book of the Revelation, many of them make claims about, well, I know what this passage, I know what this, I know what the number of the beast is, and I know what this is, and, but when there's things, there are things on purpose that God put in the book of the Revelation, they were meant to be mysterious. They were meant to be a little cryptic. They were, they were not intended for everyone to be able to just know what they mean. And so, uh, you know, so, so it's, it's really not good scholarship to, you know, to, uh, to start with something that you, you believe and then try to make the scriptures fit you know, what it is you believe and, uh, and, and so forth. So that's the first thing. The second thing, though, and it's really the one I'm going to deal with with mostly, and it's really the, the foundation of this study. The second problem that we all have, and when I say we, I mean pretty much anybody of our current age and anybody who comes up within Christian tradition, is that we, we tend to try to interpret the book of the Revelation by some uh, perspective other than the perspective that the original audience had. And I know we've talked about this over the past year. It is critical. Listen, if we're, if we're going to rightly divide scriptures, if we're going to really understand God's word, we have to first go back and do the best we can to try to hear it, read it, study it as the original audience would have done so. You see, we're, we, we live in, in, you know, in, in, in uh, you know, 2024, and, uh, and we're, we're Gentile, New Testament Christians, and we've come up through a lot of Christian traditions that don't necessarily help us with this book. And you'll, you'll see what I mean here in just a little bit. So I'm going to avoid these two errors. Yes? So what was the first one? Better the first what? Uh, not, uh, they're not clear in Scripture. Sorry, they're not clear in Scripture. Yeah, if it's not clear, listen, if, if God wants us to know, if something is super, super important, and God wants it to be, you know, absolutely, we would, we're supposed to be dogmatic about something, He's going to make that pretty clear in Scripture, okay? If something's not clear in Scripture, we shouldn't say that we know, you know, all about it. So, so, uh, so, l so let me, let me, uh, let me move on here. So, I'm going to avoid these by not being dogmatic. Listen, there are parts of the book of the Revelation that, you know, the best, the best scholars can do is simply say, well, here's what I think this means, or here's what I think is happening here. And, uh, you know, and, and, and that ha just has to be good enough. But the biggest thing is that I'm approaching this from the perspective of the original audience. That's why I've chosen to call it Revelation in Real Time. Because there was a real time when this book was given, and it was given to real people who were experiencing real things, and that's the primary reason the book was given. It wasn't given just for it to sit for 2,000 years waiting for us to read it and figure out what it means, okay? It was given to an original audience. So the question then is, who's that original audience? Who were, who were the people that God, through John, uh, had, had penned this book and it, was, and it was given to them? Well, this original audience, they were seven independent churches or independent congregations of, of Jesus followers, all right? So these were seven very real churches in very real places, gatherings of people. Now, not necessarily like our church, maybe. They could have been just people who gathered in a home, could have been a small group, could have been a big group. We don't really know. But these were congregations. But here's the thing. These were not, even though they were not located in Israel, they were still mostly 
Jewish followers of Jesus. In other words, most of the early church, in fact, nearly all of the early church, they weren't Gentiles. Most of them were not Gentiles. Yes, they were in lands other than Israel, but you remember in those days, what happened after Jesus was crucified, or in, in the days, uh, you know, right around when Jesus, after Jesus was crucified, well, the Jews were scattered everywhere. They were scattered everywhere. You know, they, they weren't located. And in fact, 500 years prior to that, they had already, many of them, been scattered everywhere. And were, but they kept their Jewish traditions. They kept their Jewish culture everywhere they went. So, for example, the church in Ephesus was, uh, yes, that's a Gentile area. That's, a, that's not Israel. But the people who gathered, the people who became believers are what we might call Jewish followers of Jesus or we might call them Messianic Jews. That's where that term comes from. In other words, they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, unlike the majority of Israel at the time. So, so that's, that's what we're talking about. You know, the and so that's the perspective we have to come at this from. We have to come at this from a perspective that is more Jewish than Gentile. And, and let me just uh, let me just kind of kind of take a moment here. I taught this a few years ago. There are two different kinds of cultures when it comes to evaluating the world, and in particular, uh, you know, scripture or uh, uh, spiritual things. There's what's called a Hebrew culture, and there's what's called a Greek culture. Now, those don't necessarily mean that Hebrew is only Israel or that Greek is only Greece. That just those are terms that re refer to cultures, but they view the world differently. We live in a Greek culture, for instance. We, we uh, you know, Americans, we have all grown up in, in what's called a Greek culture. Let me explain the difference. So the Greek culture, uh, a, a Greek culture is very much analytical, very much detail oriented. In other words, you know, for example, if I brought a chair up, if I brought one of these chairs and set it up here and I, and I, I was speaking to somebody from a Greek culture, I would say, describe this for me. Well, what would they do? They would talk about the they would talk about the color. They would talk about it's padded. They would talk about the metal frame. They would talk about how it's what it looks like and, and all that. If I brought somebody from a Hebrew culture though and said, describe that chair for me, and they would say, You sit on it. <laughs> you sit on it. The a Hebrew culture is very much function oriented or image or picture oriented. Even the language of Hebrew is a very picture oriented language. Greek culture, on the other hand, is very much, you know, well, let's just describe the components of it. Now, that's very, very important when we consider that the book of the Revelation is very much a visual book, is it not? It's all about symbols. It's all about, uh, you know, uh, uh, typologies. And it's, you know, much of it is, much of it conjures up an image. It's a picture language. And that is because it was written in a Hebrew style. John is the author. The, the, the penman of the, of the book of the Revelation is, is John. Now, we presume that to be uh, the Apostle John. I think that makes sense. I think it makes sense to assume that it's John. It's not ever told us that it's the Apostle John, but I think we can understand it probably was. He was such a prominent figure at the time. He was a leader of the church. If it was some other John, it prob they probably would have distinguished themselves somehow uh, you know, to make everybody know that they were not the Apostle John. So, John was a Jew, obviously, and uh, and even though John was most likely, he was more like he it was most likely he was bilingual. He probably understood Hebrew very well, of course. He also understood what's called Koine Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in. But it's kind of hard to imagine that Jesus wouldn't have spoken to him in Hebrew. Y you follow me? Because Jesus was. Jewish and John was Jewish. Yohanan was is a is a is a Jewish name. So even if somehow the the book of the Revelation was given to John in Greek, it certainly is written in a Hebrew style. Again, the images, the didn't, didn't you ever wonder how <clears throat> why there are terms like the synagogue of Satan written in there? You know, we have these expressions, we have some of these fantastic visual images. Uh, how many of you have read the book of the Revelation? Raise your hand, just so I, I kind of get an idea. Okay, so you've read about, for example, you've read about locusts the size of men with the faces of men and a tail of a scorpion rising up out of a pit and, and going all over there, you know, and, and I mean that, that create, now if, if, if we're looking at that through our perspective, you know, we're picturing literally this like locust legs and, you know, a tail and all this. And, and that could very well be, but from a Hebrew cultural perspective, 
what we're talking about is just a, a, a ferocious, vicious, violent attacker of mankind. It could be, it could be a, a, a military helicopter, for all we know. You, you follow what I'm saying? So the Hebrew culture sees it differently. The Jews that, to which this was originally given, they saw something completely different than what we see. When we read through it, we read through it as, as very much from a Greek perspective, looking at all the details, looking at everything literally, but that's not necessarily how it ought to be read. So we're going to go back and we're going to look at this from the perspective then of this original audience, this, these original seven independent congregations of Christians trying to make it in a very, very difficult time to be a Christian. So let's dive into this and uh, let's, let's get some scripture up here on the board. Revelation chapter one and verse number one. Here we go. And by the way, this is not going to be a lengthy series. I, I once had to endure a three-year uh, study of the book of the Revelation, which was about as dry as, uh, you know, as, as if you still have Christmas cookies in your house. Yeah, it was that dry. And, uh, and it was just torture. And, uh, you know, I, this is nothing like that. This is probably a six or seven week uh, study, but, uh, uh, but we're, we'll just kind of see where it goes. Here we go. The Revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. I draw your attention back, as I did Sunday morning, to the first five words there, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to re-preach what I preached on Sunday. You can get on YouTube and listen to that. But what we were talking about on Sunday was... This book is a revelation of what I call the real Jesus. Now, it's not that the Jesus we read about in the Gospels wasn't real Jesus also. I mean, it, you know, it's, you know the, the, he, yes, Jesus was the good shepherd. Yes, Jesus was that kind and loving shepherd who cared for his sheep. Yes, Jesus was that uh, Savior who looked down on Jerusalem and, 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 and wept when he saw the people were scattered as sheep without, uh, without a shepherd. Yes, that was Jesus. That same Jesus who was so compassionate, so loving, and so gentle much of the time, that was the real Jesus also. However, when I, the point I was trying to make on Sunday and that we're going to kind of look at tonight and really what this book is about, the Jesus that we see in the book of the Revelation is no longer that lamb being led to slaughter. All right, he's the lion of Judah. You know, we talk about, we're already looking forward to March, yes? We're all, we're all tired of this. We're all sick of this winter. And, you know, they talk about March uh, coming in like a, a, like a lion and going out like a lamb. Well, the book of the Revelation describes Jesus as the Lion of Judah. He's going to come in as a lion. He's going to stay a lion. <laughs> okay, that's just how it works and, uh, and so forth. Now, but what I want to draw your attention to tonight is that word Revelation. The word revelation. On your study guide, I gave you the Greek word. The Greek word is apocalypsis. Now, what does apocalypsis sound like? Apocalypse. Obviously, that's where we get the word apocalypse. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. What does the word apocalypse or revelation, same thing, revelation in English, apocalypse in Greek, what does that mean? Me. Now, if you have a Bible, before you answer, if you have a Bible that defines it, please sit this one out. All right? And if you're smart like Suzanne is always, you sit this one out too. <laughs> Nobody likes a know-it-all. No, no. Actually, everybody likes, loves that know-it-all. Uh, listen, if you, so, so you just tell me, according to your, your, your experience, right, let's just talk about your experience in life, my experience in life, your experience in church, or in just being a, a citizen of the world. What does the word apocalypse mean? What, what, what images do you have in your head when you hear apocalypse? John? Uh, for me, uh, I'm an uber nerd. So um, I look at, uh, there's a movie called uh, X-Men Apocalypse. Okay, so so you see these, uh, you see the superpowers, you see the supernatural part of it. What do you see? Fire. Fire. What else? Apocalypse. Kurt. Ragnarok. Ragnarok? Ragnarok? <laughs> You're a Thor. Is that a Thor thing? <laughs> War. War. Use Armageddon, right? You know, in time. Oh, go ahead. Destruction. Destruction. In times, right? Go ahead. Revealing something. <laughs> I said, if you're a smarty pants, don't answer. Sit this one out. <laughs> that is what it is. Look, that's so. So, look for most of us, though. That's what we think, right? We think 
Oh. Armageddon. We think, you know, apocalypse, that's the end of the world kind of stuff, right? When we, <clears throat> some even think zombies, you know, that sort of thing. You know, that's, that's kind of what we Im imagine. Where'd we get that idea? Well, that seems like that's what apocalypse means. But that's actually not at all what the word apocalypse means. The word apocalypse or the word revelation means exactly what Chad just said. It actually is a word that just simply means a revealing of something that has previously been hidden. The word, but that's hard to believe, isn't it? But the word apocalypse, you and I have been so conditioned. This is where we, this is where we see one of the first flaws that that have come about with this book because of the, honestly, the religious culture for 2,000 years, religion has been making the word apocalypse into something that it's not. We think of apocalypse as all these end time events, wars and, and chaos and cataclysms, natural disasters, all these things, but it actually doesn't mean any of that. It simply means a revealing of something that has previously been hidden. It's actually a very simple an innocuous word. And, and so it's, it's, you know, it's interesting though, isn't it? It's very interesting that practically all of us, except for Chad and Suzanne, of course, <laughs> we all, we all thought that apocalypse meant, yeah, destruction, end time events. And so it shows us the, the it's interesting because actually every culture in the world associates the word apocalypse with end time events and cataclysms and all of that. So, and, and they really have no idea that the word apocalypse first appears in the Bible, in the book of the Revelation. But the, but the fascinating part is how we've changed its definition over the last 2,000 years to be all about those events that come later in the book of the Revelation. You see, where'd we get all that? How did that happen? How did the word apocalypse come to mean earthquakes and Armageddon and all those things? Well, because the church has read the book of the Revelation for 2,000 years and we've always focused on those later events. See, those are the things we focus on. Those are the things we, we dwell on because after all, they're cool. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's cool to think about what could these locusts really be, you know? I mean, because it's really these man-sized locusts and, you know, and it's going to do all that. So, so this is what has happened. And so, but what's happened then, and here's the sad part though. So what's actually happened is we as a Christian culture, we have taken the focus away from where it really should be, which is the first part of the book. The message to these churches, to the, the viewpoint they would have had, and we've shifted it, and we basically just, some of those, you know, don't, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I think most of us, when we read the book of the Revelation, we basically read the first three chapters just because we have to, to get to chapter four. Because that's where all the cool stuff starts. The problem with that is, the focus was supposed to be on that first part. The focus was supposed to be that, and from a Hebrew perspective, the original audience, they would have, of course, read the last part of the book. And I'll, I'll explain how it breaks down here in a minute. They would have read it. They would have had some interest in all those end time events. They would have, of course, wanted to know what's going to happen. But their primary focus would have been on that part of it that was written to them for that part of their lives because they needed to know how to get by because they were under severe persecution. And there was a message that God was giving to them to encourage them. The book of the Revelation, the purpose of the book of the Revelation was not to reveal so many cool things about what's going to happen and what Hollywood can make movies out of. It was to encourage the Christians. And that purpose is still here today. We should be encouraged by the book. Not scared of it. Not fascinated by all the later events. So, so that's, the approach, that's the approach we're going to be taking here. And uh, so let me, uh, in fact, let me just kind of show you how we have been so conditioned to sort of ignore this first part of it. Let's, um, let's go back to verse, uh, let's look, take a look here at verse number one. And notice maybe a, maybe a phrase that you, you may have noticed, but probably haven't spent a whole lot of time thinking about because it doesn't seem to fit in. Watch what this verse says. 
The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must... What are the next words? Shortly come to pass. Now, we have... We either have a wrong focus by focusing on all those things that are going to happen in the distant future, or, or this verse is, is not accurate. I mean, it says, shortly come to pass. Wait, has, has, have, 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 have you seen any of those locusts yet? It's been 2,000 years. Have you, you know, has Jesus come down and split a mountain in half standing on it yet? Not yet, not yet but it's been 2,000 years. You know, all these events that we tend to focus on, guess what? They haven't happened yet, have they? They haven't happened yet. So was John wrong when he wrote, hey, God is giving this letter to his servants to show what must shortly come to pass. So was he wrong in that? Or is there a portion of the book of the Revelation that did actually come to pass already? And of course, that is the correct answer. So, so you know, we, we see this and, you know, and, and if we're not careful, we could look at that and say, well, man, I mean, 2,000 years, this, this verse, you know, you know, these things haven't come to pass. Well, here's where we need to figure out which things were those things that were shortly come to pass and which are those things that are held for a, a distant future. And that's going to be the key. So let's take a minute and let's break down the book. Let me quickly break down the book for you and tell you what, uh, how, how it's set up. So there are 22 chapters in, uh, uh, in, in the book of the Revelation. The first three deal with a, what we could call an undetermined or a, you know, it's not a specif unspecified period of time, but it wasn't going to be very many years. This is, this is the this is the time period to which this book was given to these seven churches for their time, their, the time in which they lived. So, when John said here, there are some things that will shortly come to pass, he was speaking to those churches about some things that were actually going to come to pass in their lifetimes. You follow me? So, so what he said is true here. You know, now... He was not telling them that all of those things you read about later in the book of the Revelation are going to come to pass shortly. Those are held for a, a much distant in the future. But there were some things that were coming to pass. And this is what they would have focused on. They would have been keyed in. They would have been coming, gathering together saying, hey, what is John telling us are going to happen to us tomorrow? What's going to be happening to us in the next few weeks, the next few years? This is what they would have been focused on, and it's kind of what we're going to focus on to begin with. So the first three chapters, they deal with, they deal with this period of time that was the real time, these churches in, in, that they were living. The, they would have been living in what we might call the church age, or the age of grace. For those of you who haven't studied the rightly dividing with me... Um, as you go back through time, if you go back to the time of Adam, you know, Adam lived in a very specific period of time where God dealt with Adam in a way he never dealt with anybody else. That was kind of an age of innocence. And then he dealt with Noah in a different way. And, you know, we had this age of law. That's, uh, you know, where God gave the law to his people. And, and then the cross happened and we entered into a different age. The Bible word is dispensation, but we entered into kind of a different age. God's dealing with us differently than he dealt with those Jews in the Old Testament, isn't he? You, you don't follow all of those laws, all six, 613 laws, do you? Of course we don't. You know, we don't follow all the dietary laws. We don't, we don't worry about whether or not we have two different kinds of fabric in our clothing. You know, but that's how they did that. You know, you, know, you remember that Jesus had no seam in his, uh, in his robe? That's because that was a part of the law. So there, you know, we didn't, so we, at the cross, everything's kind of changed and we moved into what's called the age of grace or the church age. That was still in effect. So these first three chapters are still dealing with churches. But for those of you who have read through the book of the Revelation, an interesting thing happens. After the third chapter, you don't hear anything else about the church. The church doesn't appear anywhere else in the book of the Revelation. Can somebody tell me why? Yeah, our word is the rapture. You see, the church age is that first three books. He's talking to the churches about how to hang on and how to make it and, and stay faithful. He said, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you out of there. And, and he's talking to those, to those, uh, those uh, churches. And that also then kind of extends then to us for a church age. But yes, at the end of this age, the church is going to be removed. And that happens somewhere between chapter 3 and chapter 4 of the book of the Revelation. That's why the church doesn't appear anymore. Because... 
We're with Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, that's a whole different... We'll, we'll study that a little bit more in detail. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that, huh? But that's when then all these things begin to take place. So, so the first three chapters, that's kind of what the, the focus is there. That's the first part of this book. From chapter 4 to chapter 20 then, that is what we call that period of time... It's presumed, I believe, it's a seven-year period of time. There are some who believe it's three and a half. We're not going to argue about it. I'm not going to worry about that. I believe the scriptures lead to seven. But it's a seven-year period of time we call the what? The tribulation. Broken into two halves, the early, the first three and a half years, mostly peaceful. The second three and a half years, literally hell on earth. Where, where Satan is given full reign to do everything he wants to do and try to persecute the church. But, so that's what we call that, uh, that, uh, the, the tribulation. And, uh, and then there's a thousand year reign of Christ. And then chapters 20, uh, 21 and 22, they, they, they take us then into this period of time that is called the eternal kingdom. That's that new heaven, new earth, everything's new and so forth. So that's kind of how the book is broken down. Now, my point though tonight, I want to get back to my point tonight then. Most of our focus, again, if you've been in very many of these kind of studies, if you've been in church very long, most of our focus, we've been conditioned to focus on chapters 4 through 20, haven't we? That's what we think about. When somebody says, hey, man, you ever study the Revelation? You're thinking, yeah, man, it's those plagues and it's those, uh, those, those, those uh, you know, cataclysms and, you know, and all this and Armageddon and all those things. And that's what we think the book's about. But guys, that's not what this book's about. It's really not. That's a secondary thing. The main purpose of this book was what he gave to the original audience in particular, which they focused on these first three chapters. Now, so to show you how important that is and why, why we have to be careful about the way we've sort of been conditioned to think about this is this. How do you know that those fantastic events we read about? The, the, uh, you know, the mountain splitting apart, the earthquakes, the, 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 the four horsemen, the, the two witnesses who are killed and they lie in, in Jerusalem for three days and then they rise back from the dead. How do you know those fantastic things are actually going to happen? How can you know that? You could say faith, but honestly... Faith is really not a good answer, and I'll tell you why. Because you can't know anything by faith. You can believe something by faith, but you can't know anything by faith. So how can we know, Tom, that those events, those crazy, fantastic events are going to happen? How can we know that all that that we read about in 4 through 20, how can we know that's going to happen? I'll tell you how I think we can know it's going to happen. Because we have prophesied events in the first three chapters that have already happened. They came true. What Jesus said was going to happen in these first three chapters with these churches, the message he gave to these churches, that came through. Came true. So if he came through on the first three chapters, we have every reason to believe that he's going to come through on the rest of it, yes? yes. You see how important it is? that we study from the perspective of the original audience. Because if we'll go back and, and think about what was important to them, and we'll see the things that Jesus said were going to happen to them, and they did, and the ways they should uh, approach it, and they did, when we can look back through history and see those things were true, well, that gives us every reason to absolutely believe that he really is going to come back on a horse, and we really are going to follow him on, you know, somehow. And he really is going to destroy the, all the enemies and all the evil and all the wickedness in this world with his spoken word. We can believe all that because we've already seen him come through on the rest of it. Okay? So, so, um, so our faith is really built up more by, by studying the early part of this book, the first three chapters, more than the last. Now, just so you don't, just so you say, oh, this isn't what I wanted. We will get to all the cool stuff. All right? We're going to talk about how the Hebrews read the mark of the beast, and it's going to surprise you. It's not what we think. You know, I think we all picture a, a, a tattoo, 666, six, six, on everybody's forehead. I don't want a tattoo. You know, I wouldn't get that tattoo. But that's what we think. It's not how they read it. We're going to learn how they read that, how they interpreted that. And it's really not as mysterious as we make it. It was never really meant to be all that mysterious because 
the Jews understood exactly what was being said there. We're going to learn that. So just kind of hang on uh, until we get there. So let's, uh, let's get back to our text then. Verse number two. Here we go. So he continues on. Who bear record of the word of God. And by the way, each, we're going to go much faster than this. We're, we're only going to get into these verses tonight. But we'll go much faster after tonight. Who bear record of the word of God, of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Let me take a time out. He is promising a blessing to anybody who reads this letter. I mean, that right there is a pretty cool thing. You want a blessing from God? Just read it. You don't have to do anything else. You don't even have to, you don't have to meditate on it. You don't have to study it. You don't have to come to church. But you ought to come to church. I wish he had said that. You don't have to come to church. You just have to read it. You just have to read it. But then he said, notice, and he said, and hear the words of the prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. Now, here's where this original audience would have seen this completely different than the way we do. You see, they were being, it was being written directly to them. They were being told, hey, you need to pay attention to these early things that God is, that, that uh, John is telling you because your blessing depends on it. So, now, but here's, here's what I want to draw your attention to. Again, these are the phrases we kind of, we kind of skip over. What does the last part of this verse say? For the time is... We're only three verses into this book, and can't you already see how we have all been guilty of sort of focusing on things that are going to happen 2,000 years after this was written when he's talking about things that are going to happen right now? You see that? That's, that's what I wanted us all to get tonight. We have to sort of get out of our... Greek-oriented culture, our 21st century Gentile, pretty much an easy Christianity. I mean, let's be honest. We've got it pretty easy. From a faith standpoint. I mean, from a, from a, you know, from a standpoint of what it means to be a part of the family of God. We don't have to really do a whole lot. We just have to believe. Jesus did it all. He did everything. But it wasn't always that way. But he said, for the time is at hand. So he's speaking to people for whom this book was very timely. It was, revela it was revealing of something in real time, like today for them. And we want to understand how they read it. So let's kind of get into the minds of that audience then. And uh, let's take a look at verse 4. Let's continue on here. And we're, uh, I've, got to, I've got to hurry. Here we go. So John to the seven churches, this is the audience he was talking to. The seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Probably next week we'll talk about what most of the Hebrew scholars would say these seven spirits are. You know, we don't really think about that much uh, before his throne. But what I want to draw your attention uh, to here is this, uh, this, this uh, expression here, which was and which is to come. I'm sorry, which is and which was and which is to come. All right. Th that denotes three different tenses, right? It's a, it's a present tense, which is. It's a past tense, which was. And it's a future tense, which, which is to come. Now, this obviously is speaking about Jesus, but let's, we're going to come back to this verse. Let's go ahead and read. So there's no question who's being talked about here. Look at verse 5. We'll come back to that. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, again, you, you note, notice there he is clearly speaking to Messianic Jews. Jewish followers of Jesus, not, not, uh, not uh, you know, Orthodox, uh, you know, not Judaism. And again, I guess I should have said this at the beginning. Remember, a term like Jewish, yes, it has a religious connotation, but it's also a culture. Messianic Jews still keep the traditions of being Jewish. Okay, they still grow up with the same traditions. So that's kind of what we're, that, that, that's, that's what we were talking about. And so, and from Jesus Christ, who's a faithful witness and so forth, washed in his own blood. So we know that uh, he's talking about uh, those who are followers of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God. Now I'm just going to take a little time out here. Have you ever dwelt on that part of that verse when you read the book of the Revelation? Of course not, because we don't know what it means. <laughs> Because it's hard, and it sounds weird, and we want to get to the apocalypse stuff. 
We want to get to that cool stuff. But he said we're going to be kings. Wait. Jesus told you you're going to be a king. I'm going to be a king. And we pass over that in order to get to that other stuff. And we don't stop and think, well, what does that mean? What does it mean he's, we're going to be kings and priests and, and all of that? And to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, we're going to talk about what that means. We're going to look at what that original group of people who got this letter, how they would have read that, how they would have interpreted that. And I think we're going to be pretty encouraged by it. So let's go back now to verse number four. And let me kind of finish up with this. Let me finish up with this, this, this expression here. From him which is and which was and which is to come. That is a past, a present, and a future um, uh, uh, image that we get there. Now, this is actually a reference to the Bible. The Bible refers to Jesus, and we've even sung, uh, I think this, the, the hymn is praise him. Uh, there's an expression, crown him, crown him. Does anybody know the last part? Prophet and priest and king. That's what this is a reference to. The Bible refers to Jesus as a prophet and Jesus as a priest, and Jesus as a king. Now let's talk about how this all works in this time period in which we're talking about. Jesus was a prophet. When he, was a, uh, when he walked as a man, his earth, he was a prophet. What does a prophet do? Well, a prophet is somebody in the past foretelling the future, right? That's what a prophet does. Jesus often said, hey, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a... Sorry, I just spit on you. <laughs> What how you sit up here, you that's what you get. But I appreciate you. <clears throat> that's why we keep tissues up here. What was I talking about? Ah, Pat, prophet. Jesus often said, Hey, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a mustard, you know, a, a, a tree, and or kingdom of heaven is like this. You know, Jesus was often saying, Hey, this is what's going to happen someday. You know, like when Jesus said, uh, you know, I'm gonna come as a thief in the night. You know, he's going to come as a thief in the night. What does that mean? What does a thief do? A thief comes into your home very quietly, though. They, you, the, the inhabitants don't know the thief is in there. They come in, they steal out what is valuable, and the people wake up the next morning and wonder, what happened to our stuff? And that's what Jesus was saying the rapture is going to be. He was talking about the rapture. He said, I'll come as a thief in the night. I'm going to take out what is, what is valuable. And the people of this world are going to be left in the morning when they wake up thinking, where's Kurt? You know, where's Chad? Where's, Sh well, I'm not sure you're going to make it. But <laughs> you, you see, Jesus was a prophet while he was here. That's past tense. The which is. He, so what was Jesus doing when he wrote this letter to these churches? He was in heaven fulfilling the role of a priest. What does a priest do? A priest intercedes for the people to God. Isn't that what a priest does? Yep. The book of Hebrews says, and know this, we have a great high priest who is, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever lives to make intercession for his saints. You see, this talking about Jesus here, he's, he's identifying himself as that prophet which told them what was going to happen. At the current time, he is the priest, he's in heaven, interceding for this, these churches. And don't you know, that had to be an encouragement to those churches? Yeah. He was saying, you're not alone. I've got God's ear. I'm, I'm on the right hand of the Father. I'm interceding for you. There's nothing happening to you that I don't tell him about. You see, this is, this is kind of the feeling that they were getting. And then the final thing, though, and, and which is to come. We said prophet, priest, and... And of course, that's the future role of Jesus. What happens, what begins to happen in chapter 4 and takes us all the way to chapter 20, that is the king coming and reigning supreme. That's, that is the time when all of the other Elohim that we studied about last year, all these other gods, they find out what the difference is between gods, between being, a, being sons of God and being the son of God. You follow me? They're going to find out just who is in charge. And that's what it really 
is all about. Prophet, priest, and king. So this book has three parts, really, if you want to break it down this way. It has these first three chapters dealing with those churches, real time. These are the events that happen to them. We're going to study that first. And then chapter four uh, takes us through those uh, through that period of time we call the tribulation and, and into the thousand year reign of Christ. All those crazy, uh, fantastic things that are going to happen. Jesus is showing his power. He's also trying to reach his own people, the Jews, and so forth. And then finally, it will show Jesus coming and reigning as king in, uh, in the end. And then, and then of course, uh, that's, that's how, the book, how, how the book ends. So we're going to focus first on the message to the seven churches. We're going we're to understand what the original purpose was for this, this letter. It really was a letter. It's not even a book. It was a letter. A letter written to these churches. We're going we're gonna to get their perspective first, and then we will study after that. We'll study what Jesus said is going to happen in the end times, and we'll learn that there really is nothing we have to worry about. <laughs> you have nothing to worry about. That's why I titled tonight's study, It's Not All About Scary Stuff. Okay? Listen, it's only scary if you're lost. Please, don't, I know you're packing up, but hear this last thing. It's only scary if you're lost. And it should be scary if you're lost. You know, years ago, there was a series of books written. Many of you may have read. I thought they were, they were wonderful reads. They were very entertaining and very nice to read. The Left Behind series, you remember that? And, and, I, and I thought it was good because it brought some attention to this kind of, this concept. But, please, please, please hear me, church. It was not biblically accurate. Understand, there, is not, there are not going to be mass salvations of Gentiles during the tribulation period. Listen, your opportunity to be saved is right now. It's right now. Your friends, your family. If we're going to win people, it needs to be now. I, I would, I mean, of course I have this feeling like, you know, well, man, if I'm taken out of this world, surely the people I've witnessed to, surely the people who know me, surely they're, they're going to notice that I'm gone and they're going to kind of put two and two together. And they're but the Bible does not say that there are going to be a lot of Gentile salvation. When the, when the church is removed, remember the Holy Spirit goes with us. Lost people are drawn to Jesus by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit leaves with the church, the only spiritual influences left on this earth primarily are going to be dark ones. Mm -hmm. Now, God is going to return His attention to His people, the Jews. That's what those 144,000 witnesses are. They're 12,000 from each tribe. They're all Jews reaching Jews. Just like the message of the, that was in the Gospels. You with me? I know it's 8 o'clock. Time to go. Wasn't that the message of the Gospels? Yeah. Hey, Jesus came and he said, go to the Jews, go to the Jews, go to the Jews, go to the Jews. The Jews rejected him. And then he said, now go to the Gentiles. Yeah. But once the rapture takes place, God's attention returns to his people. He is going to make a big, big focus and effort to reach the Jews. So listen, you should be afraid. If you're not a Christian right now, if you're not, you should be afraid. But you don't have to be. You don't have to be. Okay? And let's make sure that we get that message to the people who need it. Mm -hmm. Meantime, we're going to keep studying so we have answers yeah. to give to people. All right.